Hey everybody, this lecture is on the radio communications information you need to know for the FAA Part 107 exam. This is one of those topics that is primarily geared toward manned aircraft pilots, and you'll probably never be in a situation as a drone pilot where you need to communicate directly with aircraft or with a control tower. Actually, you'd need a separate FCC license for that anyway. You're not even required as a drone pilot to have a radio for listening in to the air traffic communications. But if you're flying near an airport, knowing what frequencies to tune into and what kind of information you can get may be useful and increase your situational awareness. If you've got a copy of the FAA's Remote Pilot Study Guide, and you really should download this for reference if you don't have it already, the information for this lecture is mostly coming from Chapter 7 on Radio Communication Procedures. That's pages 39 to 42. There's a link here on the slide for where you can download the study guide if you don't already have it. Now there are two main things that we're going to cover for radio communications. The first is the easy part and the fun part where you learn how to talk like a real pilot. This is really just getting to know the shorthand lingo that pilots use, which will help you figure out what they're talking about if you ever have to listen in. The second part is the tricky part. That's where we're going to cover what the different radio frequencies and systems are that are used at different types of airports, and we'll look into where you can find that information on sectional charts and in the chart supplement. Okay, first let's look at standard radio procedures. Aviation radio communication normally follows a standard procedure or order. Look at the example at the bottom. Spokane Ground, Alpha 1234 Quebec on West Apron. Request taxi to active runway. Over. You start out by saying who you're calling. In this case, Spokane Ground. And then you say uh, who you are using your plane's call sign. In this case, Alpha 1234 Quebec. And where you are. West Apron. Or you might say inbound 10 miles. Then you make your request or relay your information. Request taxi to active runway, and then you end with over, so the receiver knows that you're done. Now, two things to note here. First, facility types are usually shortened for easy use. So instead of saying ground control tower, you shorten it to just ground. Second, call signs are a unique alphanumeric code assigned to each aircraft. And drones actually have them too once you register your drone. And for clarity, we use a phonetic alphabet to relay the call sign. Okay, so what's this phonetic alphabet thing? You ever try to give somebody your home address or an email over the phone? Wait, was that an M or an N? Did you say B as in boy or V as in Victor? When you use a word to clarify which letter you mean, that's the phon uh, phonetic alphabet. In aviation, there's a standard set of words that make up this phonetic alphabet. Now, I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to memorize these unless you're desperate to impress people. Just be familiar with what they are. Numbers are pretty much just like you'd normally say them. You just over-enunciate them and make sure that you say zero and not O. The FAA expects remote UAS pilots to at least be familiar with general radio procedures and phraseology. The two questions that come up most often on the Part 107 test relate to when aircraft should radio in for non-towered airports, and how they announce that they're beginning uh, an approach for landing. Aircraft typically should radio in when they're 10 miles out from the airport and announce their position and intention, something like Glens Ferry traffic, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot is 10 miles east inbound for landing, Glens Ferry traffic. Note this is the same pattern that we looked at before, where you say who you're calling, who you are, where you are, what you want, and then you end. However, in this case, because it's a non-towered airport and you're just broadcasting it out to the world, you give the airport name and then add traffic, meaning general traffic. Also, at the end, you conclude with the name of the airport again instead of over in case somebody didn't catch it at the beginning. Aircraft are then supposed to announce when they enter the standard traffic pattern for the airport, and from this you should be able to figure out where the plane is relative to the airport. For example, Glens Ferry, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot is entering the pattern, midfield left downwind for runway 18, Glens Ferry traffic. Okay, that was the easy part. 
This next part is about radio frequencies and how aircraft communicate with the ground and with each other. Full disclosure, this part is tricky. I'll do my best to break it down, but this was honestly one of the most confusing topics for me when I was studying for my Part 107 test. First thing to remember is that if an airport has a control tower, all communications goes through that control tower and they manage the air traffic. Simple enough. But what frequency does a pilot tune their radio to? Well, if you look at the airport information on the sectional chart, take a look at the Spokane International Airport. Below the airport name, it lists the control tower frequency as CT followed by the frequency number 118.3 megahertz in this case. But what about airports without a control tower? In those cases, there can be a couple of different frequencies that a pilot may need to be aware of, and this is where it gets tricky. Take a look at our local Pullman Moscow Regional Airport. The symbol is in magenta, so we know that there's no control tower. What frequency do we use for radio communications then? Well, it's 122.8, and how do I know that? Because it has the C in the circle behind it, which designates it as the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency. The Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, or CTAF, is the standard frequency used at non-towered airports for pilots to talk to the ground station and to each other. The CTAF is listed on the airport information of the sectional chart and is also in the chart supplement, and it's denoted by the letter C inside a circle following the frequency. For example, at the Moscow Pullman Airport, the CTAF is 122.8 MHz. In Lewiston, it's 119.4. It needs to be different because these two airports are close enough together that you could get traffic for both airports over the same frequency and it would get confusing. Okay, now that would be straightforward enough if that were the end of it, but it's not. The CTAF can be for any one of, of a number of different types of facilities that the pilots are calling into, or there may be no CTAF listed at all. A CTAF can be a part-time or in some cases even a full-time tower. It can also be a flight service station, which is a staffed facility that provides information to pilots but doesn't give instructions or handle air traffic management. A CTAF can also be a Unicom station. Unicom is an automated system for weather, radio check-ins, and airport advisory information. Most non-towered airports now have a Unicom station, and the standard frequency for that is 122.8 MHz. But you should always check the sectional chart or the chart supplement to see what the actual frequency for the Unicom station is. Okay, well, what about small, non-towered airports that don't have any CTAF listed or a Unicom station? In that case, pilots would use the standard Multicom frequency of 122.9 MHz to communicate with each other. So with the examples here, Pullman Moscow has no control tower, so its Unicom frequency, 122.8, is the CTAF. Lewiston has a tower and its frequency, 119.4 MHz, is the CTAF. The star behind the frequency and the CTAF symbol means that the Lewiston Airport is not a full-time tower. Okay, so what happens to the CTAF when the tower is closed? Nothing. The pilots can still use that frequency to talk to each other. It's just that nobody's there in the tower to listen to it. Note that Lewiston also has a Unicom station, which would provide standard airport advisory information. But if you were flying into the university's Taylor Ranch site in the Frank Church Wilderness, there's no radio frequency listed. So you would default to the Multicom frequency of 122.9 for the CTAF. Note, however, that the nearby Cabin Creek Forest Service landing strip does have a Multicom frequency listed at its, as its CTAF, and it is the standard 122.9 megahertz. Okay, but that's not all. There are additional frequencies that are listed on the sectional charts and chart supplements that you need to be aware of. These ones might actually be helpful to you if you're a drone pilot and you've got a radio. They are the frequencies that provide weather information, and there are three different weather systems, and they differ by whether they're automated and whether a human is involved and what they report and who is responsible for it. The first of these 
is the Automated Terminal Information System, or ATIS. This is the gold standard of weather information because a human being is behind the controls. You'll only find ATIS at towered airports, and when the tower closes, so does the ATIS. And if it closes, it reverts to another type of weather station. ATIS can provide information beyond just weather. Boise has an ATIS station that operates at 123.9 megahertz. The second one is the Automated Surface Observing System, or ASOS. This is a fully automated, meaning there's no human being involved, weather reporting system that's operated by the National Weather Service or the Department of Defense. All weather, all day long. Burley's Airport has an ASOS station at 135.575 megahertz. The third one is the Automated Weather Observing System, or AWOS which is also fully automated weather reporting system, but they're operated and controlled by the FAA directly. Goodings Airport has an AWOS station that operates at 124.175 megahertz. Confused yet? I sure was at this point. One of the big hangups I had was how to find these frequencies in the airport information. That's where the chart legend comes in handy. Look at the two lines below the airport name. That's where you'll find the information on the frequencies. In the first line below the name, the control tower, if it has one, will be listed as CT and then the frequency. So look at Lewiston. It has a control tower operating at 119.4 megahertz. The other piece of information on this line is the weather station type and frequency. Moscow has an ASOS station at 136.675 megahertz. Lewiston has an ASOS station at 135.575 MHz. The line below that lists the runway information and then it gives the Unicom frequency if there's a Unicom station. So Moscow's Unicom is 122.8, Lewiston's Unicom is 122.95. The CTAF symbol can be either after the control tower frequency like in Lewiston or after the Unicom frequency like in Moscow. All right, hopefully that's given you a better head start than I had on radio communications. Let's look at a couple practice questions that you're likely to see on the test. Okay, here's the first question. It refers to the testing supplement figure 21 area one. After receiving authorization from air traffic control to operate a small uh, UAS near Minot International Airport, while the control tower is operational, which radio communications frequency should be used to monitor manned aircraft and air traffic communications? So the answer to this one is C, because 118.2 megahertz is the control tower frequency for the Minot Airport, and it's the frequency that's listed as the CTAF. Okay, here's another question. Figure 22, Area 2 from the testing supplement. At Coeur d'Alene Airport, which frequency should be used as the common traffic advisory frequency to monitor airport traffic? Okay, what do you think? The answer to this one is also C. For Coeur d'Alene, the Unicom station is the CTAF denoted by the symbol in the airport information. For the other frequencies, 122.05 is the frequency to contact the Boise Flight Services, and 135.075 is the AWOS weather station at the Coeur d'Alene Airport. That's useful, but it's not going to have air traffic information on it. Okay, here's another question. What frequency is used at non-towered airports when Unicom isn't available? What do you think? The answer to this question is A. Airports without a Unicom station use the Multicom frequency. Now this is one of those numbers that you're just going to need to know. Okay, and one last one. Testing supplement figure 25, area 3. If Dallas Executive Tower is not in operation, which frequency should be used as the CTAF to monitor airport traffic? What do you think? Now this is a tricky one. I had this question on my part 107 test and I'm pretty sure at the time I got it wrong. The star next to the control tower frequency means that it's a part-time tower, 
but CTAF is always CTAF. Even if the tower's closed, pilots still use the CTAF frequency to communicate with each other. So even though the airport has a Unicom station, the correct answer here is A, 127.25 megahertz. All right, that's it for radio communications. If you're still unsure about this topic, you may want to go back and go over the material again or check out some other practice questions or sources online. If it's still not making sense to you, I honestly wouldn't worry about it too much. While you're likely to see some questions about radio communications on the Part 107 test, it will probably be only one or two questions.